Good morning. We are nearing the end of the Gospel of John today with a passage in John 20. <clears throat> so, leading up to this point in the story, the disciples, weeping, despairing, in disarray, learn that on top of their grief, the body of their beloved teacher and friend is missing. John's readers learn through Mary's eyes and words that the body has not been stolen. Jesus has come back from the dead. But no one else knows this yet, and no one else has seen him. Mary becomes the first person in the world to preach the gospel news by delivering it to the disciples. And we know that they are confused and grieving. And one thing they all clearly seem to have been certain of is that he had died. We don't know if they understand or believe Mary's words. We then learn that they go into hiding together in a house, bolting the door behind them. And it says in 2019 and following, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Here Christ is sharing the very peace of God with his people. I can't help imagining that one reason it's necessary for Jesus to say this, though, and he says it three times, is that when they're all gathered together, confused, despairing, terrified, and this person they all know was dead, walked into the locked house they were in, everybody probably started screaming at the top of their lungs. And so maybe part of what he's saying is, don't panic. But I digress. After he had said this, verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Don't doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. One of the, the larger issues John raises by, way of, by the way that he relays this story has to do with the relationship between faith and reason. In our contemporary world, it has become common to think of faith as synonymous with mythical thinking or with personal opinion and taste. And each of these kinds of things are true in their own way. We've talked about this in... in Mark's Bible classes the last few weeks. It's also important to note that the meaning of the words myth and history have developed over time. Modern Westerners don't tend to think of these words as overlapping in any way, whereas ancient people did. We still rightly say that myths are true in a way, but we don't think of them as being literally true. Their truth lies in their message at the level of the underlying ideas, 
rather than at the level of fact. Likewise, opinions are true in their own way. It's true that I prefer strawberries to all forms of melon, which are really just water pretending to be fruit. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> we've got one, one yay vote over here. The best ice cream flavor, chocolate, or the most beautiful flower, which is a tie between the uh, blue bonnet and the tulip. These are claims that are true for me, but not necessarily true for anyone else. In other words, opinions are true for the people who believe them. On the other hand, facts about what has and is happening in the world are true in a different way. They may be disputed. They may be believed to be true only by some people and denied by other people. And we may sometimes be convinced that something is a fact when it really isn't. Indeed, we seem just as susceptible to this sort of thing now as we ever have been. But a fact is not the sort of thing that can be true for some and not for others. A fact is something that's true whether I believe it or not. It's something that either is the case or isn't. It either is the case or it isn't that the earth revolves around the sun rather than the other way around. It either is the case or it isn't that Jesus was actually standing there and Thomas put his fingers in Jesus' side. That's not to say that that should be the end of the conversation. Sometimes it's very difficult to know for sure what the facts are. Sometimes the facts are obscured because they are at a distance from us, or they're in the past, or we just don't want to see them. And even when we agree on the facts, we may disagree on what they mean or how to make any sense out of them. For all these reasons, any insistence on the factuality of something should be packaged in a generous amount of humility, recognizing the, at least the possibility that I may have gotten things wrong or I may not have the full picture of things. This brings us to our next question. In what way, if any, is the content of the Christian faith true? In the late Middle Ages, I know just hearing that phrase drove some of you into a deep slumber, <laughs> but stay with me. In the late Middle Ages, when universities were first being formed, theology was called the queen of the sciences. This sounds not only out of the ordinary in the modern world, but more like a confusion of terms. We tend to think of science in the contemporary world as something entirely different and separate from faith. But the word science itself just means knowledge. It originally referred to distinct fields or categories or subjects of knowledge, the science of biology or the science of chemistry, astronomy, among others, and the science of theology. Theology, reflection on God and all things relating to God, was considered a science because it is its own field or topic, and it is, from the perspective of Christians, a kind of knowledge. It's not a collection of statements about our tastes or opinions or what we wish were the case. Belief that God exists and that God has come among us, taking on our humanity for the sake of our salvation in the person of Christ, Belief that Christ died and rose from the dead and then actually stood there showing and sharing his wounds with the people around him. These are not like beliefs about which flavor of ice cream is the best or which flower is the most beautiful. These particular claims about what God has done in Christ are presented to us by the writers of scripture as events in time and space involving living and literally breathing people. Along this line, one reason John seems to provide us with these kinds of gory details in chapter 20, even though he could have left them out, as he says at the end of the passage, is to communicate to his readers that what he was doing was not spinning fables, but relaying something that happened at a particular time and place in this world, and not simply in his imagination. And I want to focus in for a minute on what it is that he presents to us. This passage is a kind of shock, shocking combination of what we could easily think of as opposing or conflicting themes, and ideas, and elements. It's so deeply personal and intimate, fleshy, and yet at the same time it expresses and exhibits Jesus' participation in the eternal triune life of God by his communication of the Spirit of God, Jesus' own Spirit, to the disciples. He rises from the dead, conquering death and sin, 
He enters a locked home and conveys to his disciples the spirit of the one eternal transcendent God. But he does this by way of something that's deeply and intimately human. He literally breathes on them. And the breath of Jesus is also the spirit of God. And in this very way, the passage is also something akin to a creation account. Just as in Genesis, where the spirit, the breath of God, hovers over the deep as creation is coming into being. So now the spirit of God is at work again, bringing new life, where death and sin threaten to overtake us. What we're seeing is a divine act of renewal and recreation. We see God's union with and love for creation here. The salvation, salvation Christ brings about does not consist in destroying or escaping from his humanity, but in renewing it, in resurrection and reconciliation. Instead of escaping from embodiment, he rises bodily from the dead. This is a divine act, and it enables him to do emphatically fleshy things, eating, touching, breathing, walking, not to mention the, the fact that he has visible, touchable wounds. This latter detail seems especially important. He's wounded and killed, taking our woundedness to himself and holding it close. And then he shows and shares his wounds. This is not only a demonstration of the fact that he did actually receive a fatal wound, the wound of the Roman spear in his side, which was meant to ensure that the crucifixion victims were actually dead at the end of the ordeal. But when Jesus shares his wounds with Thomas, this is not a cold, rational museum exhibit that he's providing, though that's the way I have always envisioned this. I think, among other things, I've been influenced by in my reading of this passage by some of the depictions of it that I've seen throughout my life. Depictions like this, which are beautiful in their own way, but they, they present the story in their own particular way. Depictions showing Jesus with a glowing halo around his head as he kind of stoically, blandly, apathetically allows silly, doubting Thomas with his feeble faith to touch the wound. But pause for a second to think about what we see happen here. Think about wounds you've received, falling down on your bike as a child, or as an adult, I guess, and skinning your knee, breaking a bone, getting even the tiniest splinter, going to the doctor to go through a procedure or have a surgery done. Or think about how your kids are when they're injured. I don't know about you, but none of my kids has ever been very eager to expose and clean out a wound or to offer up their little fingers so we can try to dig out a buried splinter. Even in the relatively minor cases, what do we all do with our wounds and our hurt? We cover and cradle and nurse them. We hold them close. We find a position that's tolerably comfortable rather than exposing ourselves to, to pain and further injury. It's hard for us all to stop cradling our injuries and make ourselves vulnerable to others. This is true of both physical wounds and psychological and emotional wounds. The kinds of injuries, losses, grief, trauma, conflict. These are wounds that are not always visible or obvious, but they can still be rooted deep down inside us and fester and persist even when nothing shows up on the surface. And what we naturally want to do is bury them down there rather than exposing them to the light for others to see and touch. Why is this? With both the internal invisible injury and even the outward physical ones, I think maybe one factor at work is a kind of denial. We don't want to admit that there's a wound there in the first place. We don't want the injury to have happened to us at all. And the closest we can come to that being true is to bury it and try not to think about it or deal with it. Because if there is a wound, then there's a loss. There's a flaw. There's pain painful memories, painful feelings, and the likelihood of further pain in the future if we do uncover it and try to deal with it. We don't want to expose our wounds to others because wounds hurt, and we fear the pain or maybe the rejection that, we might come, that might come if we admit the wound is there and allow others to see and handle it. If this is true, then the first thing that's needed is to admit that the wound is there, that it will never not have happened. Acknowledging it and all the pain and difficulty and feelings that go with that. And this is one of the most striking things about this passage. 
We have this divine figure defeat, defeating death, entering locked buildings, conveying the spirit of God with a breath and a word. And yet at the same time, by way of the very same story, John portrays Jesus as one whose identity as the Messiah hinges on and is exhibited by this deep vulnerability to those around him. He weeps with those who weep. He feels all the feelings. And he not only takes our woundedness into himself, he, he shares them and offers that wounded vulnerability back to us for us to share in it with him. In fact, the disciples, not just Thomas, but the rest of them as well, are now only able to recognize him by his wounds. Did you notice that? The disciples in the house do not rejoice when he walks in. They rejoice when they see his wounds and therefore know him to be Jesus. Think about that. They've gone from being completely unable even to conceive, to fathom the very idea of a wounded Savior, a crucified Christ. And now there is no other way to know who he is. They seem to have undergone a kind of radical transition in that way. Only now do they realize that for him to be the anointed one is precisely for him to be a suffering and self-giving servant to all. It's the same kind of transition all Christ's followers, all the members of Christ's body, must undergo again and again, every time we forget. And we are prone to forgetting. We are saved by a wounded healer, as Henry Nouwen described him, by a Savior who takes our wounds to himself in order that we might be healed. But this also means that as difficult as it is to do, following this kind of Savior being drawn into that, in that way into the life of God means taking each other's wounds and burdens to ourselves and sharing our own with each other. Let's pray together. God, we praise your holy name. We rest gratefully in your presence this morning. We pray that you would illuminate our minds and transform our hearts. Breathe into us your spirit. Teach us to share each other's burdens.